there's been a lot of translations of this particular sutta. And what they've been doing is saying that the first foundation is the body in the body. And that's not a good definition. It's not very good. It's supposed to be the body as the body. If, it, if you use a translation of the body in the body, then that leads you to a different place. So you have to be careful with this. <coughs> and thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Kuru country, where there is a town of the Kurus named Kama Sadama. Here he addressed the monks thus, Monks, venerable sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this, Monks, this is a direct path for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and grief, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of Nibbana, namely the four foundations of mindfulness. What are the four? Here, monks, a monk abides observing the body as a body, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides observing feeling as feeling, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides observing mind as mind, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides observing mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Now we're going to go to the mindfulness of breathing. And how, monk, does a monk abide observing body as a body? Here, a monk gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or an empty hut sits down, having folded his legs crosswise. That's one thing that I kind of object to. You know, it's real funny because when you go to India, <coughs> everybody sits on the floor. They all sit cross-legged for about 20 minutes. <laughs> so when I have them sitting in chairs, they find out that their, their legs don't hurt them so much and they, they kind of like that idea. So he sets his body erect and establishes mindfulness in front of him. Ever mindful he breathes in, mindful he breathes out. Now this is the instruction for mindfulness of breathing. <coughs> breathing in long, he understands I breathe in long or breathing out long, he understands I breathe out long. Breathing in short, he understands I breathe in short. Or breathing out short, he understands I breathe out short. Now, did you hear me say focus or put your attention only at your nostril tip or your abdomen? Why? because that's not in the instruction. The key word for these two sentences is he understands. You know when you take a long breath and you know when you take a short breath. You know when your fat breath is fast, you know when it's slow. You know when your breath is very gross and where it's very subtle. It doesn't say focus on the breath. It just says, you know that this is what the breath is doing. 
so you don't over focus on the breath. Now we get into the actual instruction. He trains thus. Key words. Now this is what you need to do. I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body. Not body of breath. Not focusing on the breath. Just experiencing the whole body. He trains thus. I shall breathe out experiencing the whole body. He trains thus, I shall breathe in tranquilizing the bodily formation. Okay, so on the in-breath you tranquilize the bodily formation. He trains thus, I shall breathe out tranquilizing the bodily formation. Again, you're using the breath as the reminder to relax that tension and tightness. Now, when you l relax the tension and tightness here, it not only relaxes here, it relaxes your whole body. The meninges I was talking about the other day that goes around your brain is like a bag, but it goes all the way down your spine. So when you relax your tension and tightness here, you're actually relaxing the whole body. Now, a lot of people in, in the West, they consider the body from the neck down and mind is from the, the top of the neck up. But this is part of your body, too. Now, when you use the six R's and you relax that tension and tightness, not only are you relaxing your body, but you're relaxing your mind at the same time. Okay? So this is... This is a practice that an awful lot of people are doing, but they're not following these four simple sentences. They're not following the directions. They're told to put their attention and focus on the breath. Or put your attention on your abdomen and focus on the in and out breathing. And nowhere does it say to focus. What it's actually saying is <coughs> you're using the breath as the reminder to relax. So it doesn't matter. I, I, I practiced for a long time when they were talking about you need to see the first part of the in-breath and the middle of the in-breath and the end of the in-breath in and the pause and you, have, and you have to focus to see this. But it doesn't say that here. You understand what the breath is doing. You understand when it's long or short. But you use the breath as the reminder to relax. And if you start focusing on just the breath, now you're starting to get into your one-pointed concentration. And that's why an awful lot of people, they do meditation for a while and then they stop doing it because they, they just don't progress. It's because they're not following the directions that the Buddha gave. They're following the directions that a teacher gave who isn't following the sutta. Just as a skilled lathe operator or his apprentice when making a long turn understands I make a long turn 
or when making a short turn, he understands I make a short turn. Again, it doesn't say focus on it, it just you understand. So too, breathing in long, a monk understands I breathe in long. Breathing out long, he understands I breathe out long, and so on. <coughs> he trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body. Doesn't mean you focus on the body. But you experience it. You see that it's there. Body is there until you get to a certain place in your meditation. And then you don't feel the body anymore. It's all mental feeling that arises. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, tranquilizing the bodily formation. I shall breathe out, tranquilizing the bodily formation. So, uh, in this particular interpretation, uh, translation, it has what they call insights. Now this is taken from commentary and the insights that they're talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. Is taken from the commentary where you're over focusing or you're over concentrating just on the breath. So I'm not going to read these these insights because it's very confusing. And the way it's written, it it's, uh, does what the commentary does, is it breaks it up into separate little pieces instead of a flow. Okay, he abides independent, not craving and clinging to anything in the world. That is how a monk observes the body as a body. Then it gets into the four postures. And I've always thought that this is kind of funny. Do you know when you're sitting and when you're standing? Do you know when you're walking or you're lying down? That's all it's talking about. But when I was practicing the Mahasi method, I was told that when I was walking, I was putting my attention on my feet, I was walking very slowly, and then when I stopped at, at the end of, of a walking area, I was told to mentally tell myself that I was standing. As if I didn't know I was standing. So I've, I've always been confused by this because it's such a, a general kind of Uh, knowing what you're doing while you're doing it. <clears throat> Again, a monk is one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning, who acts in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending his limbs, <coughs> who acts in full awareness when wearing his robes and carrying his outer robe and bowl, 
who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, who acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating, who acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent. Awareness of what? Awareness of what mind is doing when you're doing these activities. And six Ring when your mind starts thinking about other things. Okay, now this next part of the Satipatthana Sutta it talks about uh, the foulness of, and of the body parts. This is a meditation that you should only do with a teacher. Because you start realizing that the this is made up of a lot of stuff that's really disgusting. And your mind can go towards aversion very easily and become completely disgusted. <coughs> I know some monks that give this meditation to students that have just gotten married. And you don't want to think about the foulness of the body when you're married, not to start off with anyway. But I had, um, I had a lot of college students that were just getting, uh, they were 20, 21, 22 years old, and they were very easily distracted by beautiful bodies and, and that sort of thing. And they had a lot of lust coming up. So they asked me, what, what am I supposed to do with this? And I said, well, <coughs> when you see somebody that you're attracted to and you start thinking about them with lustful thoughts, what you need to do is turn their body inside out in your mind and tell me what's beautiful about it. Oh, you have a beautiful liver. Your intestines are wonderful. What's beautiful about that? And there are other things that uh, are in the body. Uh, Feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints and urine. Well, if you start thinking of the body in that way while you're sitting in meditation, there's nothing to be uh, admiring. Uh, the body is is truly disgusting in a lot of ways, but we don't think of it that way. We get caught up in our mind and get caught up in the lust, but when you turn the body inside out, there's nothing that is beautiful. And what that does is it puts your mind into balance. So you can overcome lust very easily that way. <clears throat> this particular practice is not uh, not an easy practice. You it it takes a uh, about 165 days to do this practice, to, to do it correctly. So, and you do need to be around a teacher to keep your mind in balance so you don't become so repulsed by the body you want to get rid of it. Now, 
it, there, it goes into uh, charnel ground contemplations. And in India, they have places that they put bodies. After, after they die, they put them in certain places and they wait for the family to come and take care of the body. Sometimes they did, sometimes it would be a year later, but that, that's where you would go to see bodies that are rotting. And that, the whole point of that is to keep your mind in balance and not be attached to this. Now we go to the observation of feeling and how does a monk <coughs> abide observing the f observing feeling as feeling here when feeling a pleasant feeling a monk understands I feel a pleasant feeling when feeling a painful feeling he understands I feel a painful feeling now the key word here again is understand. Don't make a big deal out of these kinds of feeling. When feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands I feel a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. When feeling a worldly pleasant feeling, he understands I feel a worldly pleasant feeling. What is a worldly pleasant feeling? I know you know the answer. But I'm not, li no, I'm, I'm waiting for people to, other people to answer. Every time you will answer it. <clears throat> what is a worldly pleasant feeling? <laughs> uh, yeah, it can be. But it's a, a pleasant feeling at one of the sense doors. Okay. Um, it can be food, it can be sights, it can be sounds, it can be whatever at the sense doors. The reason that it's worldly is because you don't have the strong mindfulness to see it as it actually is. And you have a tendency to have a feeling come up and then get distracted with thoughts about the feeling. And then your thoughts just kind of carry away and you go to other things. So this is just an ordinary person that doesn't do any meditation. That's a worldly kind of feelings that they experience. When feeling an unworldly pleasant feeling, he understands I feel an unworldly pleasant feeling. Now, unworldly is talking about being in jhana. Okay? And when one of the sense doors come up, and you're in the jhana, it's not a distraction to you. It's just something that comes up by itself and you don't get carried away thinking about it. I told you before, you, you have these five aggregates. You have body, you have feeling, you have perception, you have formations or thoughts <coughs> and consciousness. Feeling and perception are always together, always. As soon as a feeling comes up, your mind says, that's nice, that's, that's pleasant, that's, that's a happy feeling. 
or if it's a painful feeling comes up, your mind says, that's painful. So perception is a part of your brain that names things. And when we think, we only think in concepts. What's a concept? Well, what's a car? Is the car the wheels? Is it the motor? Is it the windscreen? Is it the bumper? Where is a car? A car is a concept made up of a lot of different little tiny things put together to make up this idea of a car. Or this is a chair. Well, where is the chair? Is the chair the arms? Is it the legs? Is it the seat? Is it the back? Was well, made up of all of these things to make this concept. And we only think in concepts. So when you start getting deeper and deeper into your meditation and you get to a place where there's no distraction at all, your mind is very quiet. Your mind is really still for periods of time. <clears throat> you are getting close to the experience of Nibbana. And one of the definitions that you can use for the Nibbana experience is the realm of no concepts. <clears throat> so when you're feeling an, un uh, an unworldly pleasant feeling, you're feel you have feelings that still come up, but these kind of feelings it can be pleasant, very nice, but you're not taking it personally. And you're not getting distracted away from that feeling. You're staying with that feeling as long as it's there. You stay with your object of meditation and the feeling when it arises. Right? Yeah? No? Okay. You have to speak up a little. Can you say the last sentence again, please? I'm not sure I can. can David, can you say it? When the unworldly feeling arises, you don't take it personally? You don't take it personally, right? You don't get lost in, in distracting thoughts. Okay, and that's why it's called unworldly, because you're in a jhana when that happens. Now, a jhana is a word that's much misunderstood. People will say, well, that means you're practicing concentration. No, the word jhana means a level of your understanding. Now everybody comes for their interview and I start, I, I talk about you're starting to teach yourself very well because you're starting to understand more and more clearly how this process works. So it's a level of your understanding and you get into the first jhana, you understand a very little bit about how this process works, but you get into the second jhana, you start understanding more and you start getting confidence and you start feeling like you're really, it's, it's really working and, and that makes you happy. Then you get into the third jhana, your mind starts to develop this equanimity and you you have a deeper understanding about this process. 
and how to handle any hindrances when they come up. You know what to do with them now. You know how to learn from them. So, when you're feeling an unworldly feeling, it means that you're, you're, you're having a feeling that's there. It can be pleasant or painful, either one. But you're not taking it personally. You're not saying, this is my feeling, like you could control it. Do you ask a pleasant feeling to come up? No, it comes up by itself. The joy is there by itself. The comfortable feeling, the happiness is there by itself. Because your mindfulness is getting sharper. Your observation of how mind's attention moves becomes more precise. So you'll stay with your object of meditation for a longer period of time. <clears throat> when feeling a worldly painful feeling, he understands I feel a worldly painful feeling. Stub your toe, what do you do with that? Painful feeling comes up and all of a sudden you're thinking about how much you hate that feeling and taking it personally and wanting it to be different than it is and wanting to run away from the painful feeling. But a painful feeling is a painful feeling. Now I have a lot of tooth problems now. I didn't used to have so many. But when I was in Burma, I had a dentist. He really wanted to do me a favor. So he he cleaned my teeth and he broke one of the teeth. And I had to have a root canal. Now the thing in Burma, and I, I had friends that have gone through this experience, they don't clean their tools from one person to another. They don't sterilize all of their, they just use the tools. And I had a couple friends that they got real bad infections in their mouth because of that. So I'm not about ready to let them just stick these things in my mouth. And uh, this AIDS was very prevalent in Burma at the time. So no, you're not going to put any, you're not going to prick me with one of those needles because you don't clean them very well. So I allowed him to do a root canal without any painkiller. And you bet it was painful. Sometimes he'd hit, he'd hit a spot and it'd make my whole body jump. <clears throat> but while he was, he was working on me, I would take a look at my body and I was all tensed up. So I started relaxing the tension and tightness in my body and let go of all the tight muscles and that sort of thing. And I had enough time to start sending loving and kind thoughts to him while he was working on me. He was the guy that was causing the pain. After a period of time, he was satisfied that he'd gone deep enough. It felt like he was going all the way through my skull at the time, but that's okay. But as soon as he stopped causing the pain, I got a real good opportunity to see how that pain wasn't mine. It was just because the conditions are right and when he stopped those conditions, then the pain disappeared. And my mind was very peaceful and calm right after that. 
So, painful feeling, pleasant feeling, the same coin, different sides. And you treat them both in the same way. You use the six R's and allow that feeling to be there without getting in, involved in it, without getting distracted by your liking this and disliking that. And when you do that, you start developing very strong equanimity, balance of mind. So you don't get your mind doesn't start wobbling and run, try to run away when it's a painful feeling. So it's, it's a real interesting phenomena that we tend to take our feeling as this is me, this is mine, this is who I am. But when your mindfulness starts to get sharper, the like and dislike becomes less and less. And with that, there's more balance in your mind. So when feeling an unworldly painful feeling, that is a meditation pain. Oh, but it hurts so bad. And you start telling me about the pain you have in your knee or pain you have in your back. When you get to a certain place in the meditation, you don't have a body anymore. You're in a mental realm, completely mental realm. And the reason that the hindrance arises is because of some past action. And when you see it as it actually is, it's just a feeling. You don't tighten around it because you start seeing it as it is. This feeling is there. Yeah, that's true. You're not fighting with the truth. You're not trying to control the truth. You're not trying to make the truth be the way you want it to be. You allow it to be there and don't resist it and don't keep your attention on it. Let it be there by itself. Relax, smile, come back to your object of meditation. So any time that you're taking a painful feeling or pleasant feeling personally and you try to hold on to that pleasant feeling but it's not going to be there all the time. It's going to go away. Everything's impermanent. Everything is in a state of change. And that change is a lot faster than you realize. But when you're in the jhana, you're not taking things personally. So now you're seeing the unworldly feeling and how that's different from the worldly feeling. When feeling a worldly, neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands I feel a worldly, neither painful nor pleasant feeling. What is a worldly, neither painful nor pleasant feeling? That's when your mindfulness is weak and you're indifferent to whatever it is. You just don't see it, you don't pay attention to it. When feeling an unworldly, neither painful nor pleasant feeling. He understands I feel an unworldly, neither painful nor pleasant feeling. The unworldly, neither painful nor pleasant feeling is equanimity. 
So when you when you start out on your meditation, your mind is flip flopping like this. As you start to get deeper, there's less movement of mind's attention. There's more attention on your object of meditation for longer periods of time. When you get to the fourth jhana, which just has equanimity in it and tranquility both, your mind is not flip-flopping anymore. It's not moving in such radical ways. Now you start to get where your mind is vibrating. And it's pretty easy to see. As you go deeper in your meditation, that vibration becomes less and less and harder to recognize until you get to neither perception nor non-perception where you can't really tell whether there's movement of mind's attention at all. Equanimity is the highest feeling that you can have. Okay. That is the highest feeling. So your mind doesn't move and shake when a pleasant feeling arises or a painful feeling arises. You just recognize it. That's, that's what's happening right now and it's okay for it to be there, right? So, <clears throat> this is how you observe feeling as feeling. Whatever kind of feeling arises, don't take it personally, don't get caught up in it, don't try to hold on to it. It doesn't matter whether it's a painful feeling or a pleasant feeling. It doesn't matter you have that balance of mind. And it's okay for that to be like that. Now, when you get off retreat, you're going to get back into your regular life. Your mind is going to have more of a sense of balance in your daily life. You're not the things that used to get you very angry. It, it, it's not going to get you so angry anymore the things that you really hold on to and enjoy, you're not going to have as much joy. It's like when you start doing the meditation, your mind is on a roller coaster ride. Okay, it's real happy, then it's real painful, then it's happy and it's painful. And it, in your daily life, you go through that. But as you gain more and more understanding about how mind works, as you have more and more balance in your mind, the high highs and the low lows are not going to be so radical. It's going to turn out more like little waves. You're still going to have them. But they're not going to take you away and you stay angry for a week because something happened. It, it's you're going to see it, you're going to recognize that your mind is not so much in balance, then you start using the six R's and then it, it mellows out. Now another thing that helps your mind to stay with equanimity and balance is by keeping your precepts without breaking them. It's really important. You take it, you take the precepts every day <coughs> as a reminder to not break them and make a determination. I'm going to, I'm going to go through the whole day without breaking a precept at all. And after you do that for a period of time, your mind gains more and more a sense of balance and your mindfulness gets sharper. 
Okay, now we're going to go to the observation of mind. And how monks, does a monk abide observing mind as mind? Here a monk understands mind affected by lust as mind affected by lust. And a mind unaffected by lust as a mind unaffected by lust. He understands mind affected by hate as a mind affected by hate, or you could call it aversion, whatever. And a mind unaffected by hate as a mind unaffected by hate. He understands mind affected by delusion. What is delusion? I don't want you answering. Well, it's taking things personally. That is a deluded mind because that starts pulling you away and gets you to all kinds of hindrances and you're not seeing things as clearly as you can. Now, lust, I like it. Hatred, I don't like it. Delusion, that's where you start identifying and taking things personally with the like and the dislike, whatever it happens to be. In other words, lust, hatred, and delusion is craving. It's another way of describing craving. And now you start to see more and more the importance of using the six R's and relaxing and letting go of that craving. <clears throat> he understands contracted mind as contracted mind. What is a contracted mind? A mind that pulls together, gets tight. Do you know? Say it again. Uh, no, not really. It has craving in it, of course, but a contracted mind is a mind that has sloth and torpor. Uh, you get a, a fresh loaf of bread out of the oven and you go to put some butter on it, and the butter's been in the refrigerator. And the sloth and torpor mind is like the butter, and it just doesn't spread. It, it's just, it tears everything. It does all kinds of strange things. So, uh, your mind has a tendency to contract and then you start getting sleepy. And one of the causes of sloth and torpor arising is not taking enough interest in staying with your object of meditation. More interest. And when you start paying attention, you can start seeing what happens first? What happens after that? What happens after that? When you start having a, the sloth and torpor arising. If you take interest in it, then you're not going to be caught by it for very long. Now, one of the things I always tell the students to do is don't lean heavily in the chair. When you have sloth and torpor, you want to straighten your back up a little bit more than is comfortable. And then when the sloth and torpor comes, naturally you'll start slumping and you'll be able to catch it more quickly if you keep that nice and straight. And it won't stay around as long because you're paying more attention to it. You're starting to see how the process works. Because that's the way my mind has a tendency to be. 
uh, I know it very well. I can see when I'm trying to stay with my object of meditation and I start having these little quiet uh, thoughts and then they start getting bigger and bigger and then my mind starts to get a little bit dreamy and uh, I, 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 I'm not with my object of meditation anymore, I'm starting to slump. And then your head starts bobbing. Now in, in the suttas it talks about different ways of letting go of sloth and torpor. But the, the most effective way is by being able to recognize it when it first starts to come up and take more interest in how your mind is doing that. You don't have such strong interest in your object of meditation and you have like a dual mind. You have the mind that's on your object of meditation, kind of, but you have these little, little thoughts and they just start to build after a while. So you you have less attention on your object of meditation to say your spiritual friend or one of the Brahma Viharas and then you just kind of lose your object of meditation and all of a sudden you're in dreamland and then your your body just starts to slump so when you Start by sitting straighter, by sitting with your back a little straighter than is comfortable. When your mind starts to let go and your body starts to slump a little bit, you can catch it quite quick. And then you don't snap your body straight again and run back to your object of meditation. You do this in a six R way. You don't have to push it, just notice that that's what's happening. Straighten your mind up. Come back to your object of meditation after you smile. After you practice all six R's. You let it be there by itself. It is just a feeling. And it's all right for that feeling to be there. It has to be because that's the truth. When it's there, it's there. So you allow it to be there by itself, but you don't keep your attention on that feeling. You relax the tightness caused in your head. And don't over-relax it. Sometimes some people will get kind of involved with whatever hindrance it is that they have and it can be quite big, it can be quite painful and they forget the six R's and they try to do it with two R's. And that is release, relax, release, relax, release, relax. And then you come to me and you say, you know, this doesn't work. Well, if I give you a recipe for making cookies and you leave out the main ingredients, it doesn't come out so good. It's gonna be lousy tasting cookies. It's like not adding the sugar that you need for the, for the cookies or not adding the nuts or whatever it happens to be. So you have to use all six R's every time. But as you become more familiar with it, it starts to be more automatic. And you'll get to a place where you'll just notice a hindrance starting to come up and your mind all of a sudden does it by itself and comes back to the object of meditation. 
that's kind of fun when that happens. So the contracted mind is a mind that, that it, it just pulls together and does, doesn't want to let go and relax into it, into whatever it is. It wants to go to sleep. And that's a problem. And he understands a distracted mind as distracted. Now, what is a distracted mind? You have to speak up louder. A distracted mind is a mind that's restless. And you got to be friends with restlessness and sloth and torpor because they're going to stay around till you become an arahat. So you better be friendly with them. One of my friends is a, a teacher. He said, you know, the whenever a hindrance comes up, you should be grateful for it being there. Be grateful for that that hindrance coming up because that's showing you where your attachment is. Don't fight hindrances. Don't try to control distractions, whatever they happen to be. If you do, then your, your restlessness is going to get very much stronger. Now, one of the things you've heard me say a few times is before you start your sitting, you should tell yourself, I don't care what happens next. It doesn't matter what happens next. My job is only to observe, not to control, not to make something come up. Because if you try to make it come up, you're going to have lousy meditation and you're doing it to yourself. So a distracted mind is easy to let go of, especially when you recognize that there's that it is a painful feeling and it is a restless feeling. So when that comes up, it says in the suttas, to bring up a feeling of peace and calm. Feel peaceful, feel calm. And bring that feeling to your object of meditation. That will overcome the restless feeling very quickly. But the restless feeling, it mostly comes up because you're trying to control you're trying to make something be the way you want it to be. Oh, I had a really good sitting last time. I want it to happen now. Well, that's the fastest way to have restless mind. To cause yourself all kinds of problems. And that's why I say, tell yourself before you sit to develop your equanimity equanimity to such a degree that it doesn't matter what happens next. Your job is only to observe. Now, let me talk for a little bit more. I'll, I'll get to you in just a minute. One of the things that happens when it's getting time for the retreat to get done is the planning mind. What am I going to do when I get off retreat? And the planning mind is part of restlessness. But it's, it is a pleasurable feeling. And you'll have repeat thoughts over and over again. Oh, I'm going to see this person and I'm going to say this to them. And it never happens the way you plan it anyway. So it's just a waste of time. So when you get close to the end of the retreat, you start telling yourself, uh, 
when the restless mind comes up, you tell your mind, I don't need to think about this right now. I don't need to continually have these thoughts of what I'm going to do when I get off retreat. Tell yourself, I don't need to think about this right now. My job is only to observe what's happening here. And your mind will pretty much pay attention to it. But you have to mean it. Okay. I heard you say that the, the, you come into the meditation only observing. Right. And, but it seems like there's, a, there's also an intention, not controlling, but there's an intention like to... Well, of course there's intention to stay with your object of meditation. <coughs> but don't overemphasize it. Because if you do, then you're going to be putting in too much energy and you're going to get restless. So it's about finding like the equilibrium. Right. And the thing with equanimity is uh, you can have it for a period of time and your mind is really balanced and nice and then all of a sudden something changes a little bit and then you start trying a little bit and you start getting the restlessness and when you recognize that then you have to relax let it be and back off now if if you start sitting with the idea that you're going to have a good meditation and you really want to stay with your object of meditation that thought is big enough and strong enough that you're going to have lousy sitting. You're not going to stay with your object of meditation at all. And then what happens in your mind is, oh, I'm going to try harder. I really want this quiet mind. And you wind up having a really a very difficult time because your, your restlessness is so strong. And when you see that happen, back off and laugh at yourself. Oh, I got caught again. This mind is really crazy. And it's okay to be crazy. It's not my mind anyway. Right? So you have to learn to adjust. Now there can be another time when your mind just starts to get a little bit lazy and it, you start to get the sloth and torpor. Then you have to pick up your energy a little bit by taking more interest in how the process works. This is a very fascinating process. I mean, I've been a monk for 33, 34 years, something like that. And I'm never bored, ever. This process is interesting. And there's always new ways of seeing things and having these insights come up at you. Oh, that's how that happens. That's what I've been doing to cause myself suffering. So you start noticing when you have repeat thoughts and you go, ah, oh, look at that. There's too much energy in this one and I'm making too much of a big deal out of it. So I have to start backing off from that. But laughing with yourself is the fastest way that I know of to let go of restlessness, of distractions. You go from, I mean, it can be any of the emotional upsets. It can be fear, it can be anxiety, it can be aversion, whatever the catch happens to be. But when you laugh, you go from, I am that, let's say anger, 
I'm mad and I don't like this. And then you laugh and your mind goes, well, it's only this anger. Do I want to carry this around with me for a while? I'm not that stupid. I'll let it go. So developing your sense of humor about yourself is very skillful. So do you have any other question? Well, it doesn't have to be on that point, any, any point. We'll, we'll continue here. Okay, he understands an exalted mind as exalted. What is an exalted mind? Now, this is a kind of language you haven't heard before. An exalted mind is a mind that gets into the first four jhanas. Okay, your mind is exalted, it's uplifted, and it's very wholesome because you're not taking things personally, you're not being distracted away by, dis by hindrances. You're staying with your object to meditation. That's why they call it exalted, because it is raising your mind up, and that's why they call it unworldly, because most people don't have that sort of thing. Okay, he understands a surpassed mind as surpassed. What is a surpassed mind? It's a mind that, has, that practices the Brahma Viharas. They, they, in Pali, they call it the Arupa Jhanas. And an Arupa Jhana means that you're getting into a mental realm, that you don't have a body anymore. Everything that comes up is mental. You, to be quite honest, you don't even have a head anymore. So where's that consciousness? I don't know. I can't give you an answer on that one. So, having a surpassed mind means practicing the Brahma Viharas. Uh, you're, there's times when your mind is going to be with loving kindness. There's times when your mind is going to be with compassion and you'll feel expansion in your head. There's times when you're going to have joy arise, but this is a different kind of joy than you've experienced before. This kind of joy is the awakening factor of joy. It doesn't have the excitement that the, the lower jhanas have. It's a real happy feeling. So, <clears throat> the whole time that you're practicing this way, you are teaching yourself more and more subtleties about the jhanas and about these different states that you can experience. And you'll have insights into them. You'll, you'll see. Now, we're going to start to get into dependent origination tomorrow. And uh, this is the process of how this all works, how it arises. So you're going to see more and more subtleties as you start going deeper in how this is a process. There's nothing to be taken personally. It's just arising and passing away of phenomena. 
and everything is impersonal. When conditions are right for this to arise, it's going to arise. But you'll start seeing it on deeper and deeper levels, and it gets real interesting when you do that. Okay, he understands a collected mind as a collected mind. What is a collected mind? It's a mind that's very composed. A mind that gets still. It's light concentration, but I prefer to call it stillness because concentration means really focusing. And your mind is very, very alert. You're still going to hear things, you're still going to see things, but you can have very strong balance of mind while you're doing that. My teacher was Usil Ananda. He was a Burmese teacher. He was very famous in, in, in Burma. Highly educated. I mean, he, he was really smart. He memorized this many books. And even up until he died, he could recite from those books and be correct. He didn't make any mistakes. But he didn't believe that you could sit and med you could do your walking meditation or your daily activities with strong equanimity in your mind. He didn't believe it because he was a scholar more than he was a practitioner. And I finally convinced him to start practicing and he saw it for himself. And he was completely blown away. I mean, he, he was so surprised it was unbelievable. The thing with Usila Nanda and my relationship with him was that he was my teacher. There was no, no doubt about it. And he was very good at reading minds. And somebody would come up and they would ask him a question and my mind would say, Oh, it's this. And instead of him answering, he would say, you answer this one. But he was also my friend. And we could talk about personal things very deeply and get good understanding from each other from with whatever we were going through. So I had, and, and I was always playing jokes on him. <laughs> I love to make him laugh out loud. Now the Burmese, when, when you hear somebody laugh in Burma, if they're what they consider educated, when they laugh, they just lightly chuckle. And they think Americans, and they, uh, when, when they were here, uh, he used to call me Toza, which means a mountain boy, which means uneducated. Because I would laugh out loud at things. But I got him a few times. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a real interesting thing to understand that mind is not here. Mind is here. It's not part of the body, although it's connected with the body. And for him to see that he could walk with equanimity and the only thing that he felt when he was walking was the bottom of his feet. 
because there was contact. Uh, sometimes a wind would come up and you would, he would feel that, but when there was contact with something, he would feel it. But because the equanimity was so strong, it didn't make his mind shake and go to it. It just noticed that it was there and okay, that's there, that's enough. Not make a big deal out of it. So this is a, a real interesting part of the uh, observation of mind that is not really taught very well with people that are doing straight vipassana. So we're going to go to the last part, which is the observation of mind objects. And the first part of that is dealing with the hindrances, which says that this is a very important part of the practice. It's not something that you push down and push away. It's something that you use as your your teacher to show you where your your attachments are. And how does a monk abide observing mind objects as mind objects? in terms of the five hindrances. Here there being sensual desire in him, a monk understands there is sensual desire in me, or there's no sensual desire in him, so he understands there's no sensual desire in me. And it goes through the hatred and the delusion and it goes through the whole thing. Then it says, he also understands how there comes to be the arising of the unarisen sensual desire and how there comes to be the abandoning of the arisen sensual desire and how there comes to be the future non-arising of abandoned sensual desire. Now that's a complicated way of looking at it. So we'll go through this again. He understands how there comes to be the arising of unarisen sensual desire. How does that come to be? Your mindfulness gets weak and you start having distraction. Okay, that's the start of the hindrances. Doesn't matter which hindrance it is, that's why I just call them distractions. And how there comes to be the abandoning of the arisen sensual desire. How do you let it go? Use the six R's, right? And how there comes to be the future non-arising of the abandoned sensual desire. How does that come to be? Stay on your object of meditation. It's that simple. So you know how it comes up, why it comes up. You know that because of past actions and past breaking of a precept but you don't have to know exactly what precept it is that you broke. Just that this is how this process works. When my mindfulness gets weak, when I'm not staying with my object of meditation, then a hindrance is gonna come up. And it's a necessary part of the practice to be able to recognize the hindrance and know what to do with the hindrance when it arises. Use the six R's and stay with your object of meditation. Stay with what you're doing in the present. 
Okay? And you do that with all of the hindrances. You, how many times do you hear me say, don't make a big deal out of things? What am I saying? Keep your mindfulness sharp. Understand when these things happen and use your six R's to take care of them. The thing that's real important is to carry that with you in your daily life. So when a hindrance comes up, of course they're going to come up. Your mindfulness is not going to be that sharp all the time. So of course you're going to see uh, lust or hatred or so you'll get sleepy or you'll be restless or you have anxiety or you have fear. But you have to know that you have the tools to not take them personally. So you won't get caught for, with them for so long. And if, if it's a big hindrance, then ask your intuition, why am I so attached with this? Why am I taking this so personally? You'll get the answer. Again, a monk abides observing mind objects as mind objects in terms of the five aggregates when they are affected by craving and clinging. Here a monk understands such is material form, first noble truth. Such is its origin, second noble truth. Such its disappearance, third noble truth. Such is the way to that disappearance, fourth noble truth, using the six R's. Such is feeling, such its origin, such its disappearance, and the way to that disappearance. Such is perception, such its origin, such its disappearance, and the way leading to the cessation. Such are the formations, such their origin, such their disappearance, such the way to the disappearance. Such is consciousness, such is or its, its origin, such its disappearance and the way leading to that disappearance. Then we go to the six sense bases. Again, a monk abides observing mind objects as mind objects in terms of the six internal and external bases, or external mind objects, excuse me. Here, a monk understands the I. He understands form, and he understands the fetter that arose dependent on both. You have, you see color and form, you have a good working eye, you see color and form. Eye consciousness arises, there's a feeling that arises with that of I like it or I don't like it, that craving comes up. And you have to be able to use the six R's and allow it to be by itself without any attachment of taking it personally. He also, how there, uh, he understands how there comes to be the arising of the unarisen fetter. Why does it come up? Because you've lost your mindfulness. And how there comes to be the abandoning of the arisen fetter. Using the six R's and how there comes to be the future non-arising, staying with your object of meditation, whatever that happens to be. He understands the ear, he understands sounds, he understands the nose, he understands odors, he understands the tongue, 
he understands flavors, he understands the body, he understands tangibles, he understands mind, he understands mind objects, and he understands the fetter that arises dependent on both. And also understands how there comes to be the, the arising of the unarisen fetter, how there comes to be the abandoning of the arisen fetter, how there comes to be the future non-arising of the abandoned fetter. <clears throat> now we get to the awakening factors. Again, a monk abides observing mind objects as mind objects in terms of the seven awakening factors. Now the awakening factors is the mindfulness awakening factor, the investigation of your experience awakening factor, the energy awakening factor, the joy awakening factor, the tranquility awakening factor, the collectedness awakening factor, and the equanimity awakening factor. Now these, these awakening factors will happen one at a time. And as you improve your mindfulness, you'll start seeing these more and more clearly. Now the thing is, with the uh, sloth and torpor, it says in the suttas, the way you overcome sloth and torpor, is by examining your experience. How does this arise? What happens first? What happens after that? What happens after that? And as you do that, you naturally start picking up your energy. And when you pick up your energy, your mind becomes lighter and you start to have this happy feeling. Also, when you have restlessness, you bring up the feeling of tranquility the feeling of stillness or the, st the feeling of equanimity. And that will always put your mind in balance. That's what the awakening factors are for. Now the, the awakening factors will arise and be in perfect balance when your mind is ready to experience Nibbana. That's one of the things that happens in your mind. So these awakening factors, you can use them to help overcome hindrances and also to, uh, if you notice that one of the awakening factors is a bit weak, you can add a little bit more energy into it. So now we're going to get to the conclusion and that is monks, if anyone should develop these four foundations of mindfulness in such a way for seven years, one of two fruits can be expected for him, either final knowledge here and now, that means becoming an arahat, or if there is a trace of craving and clinging left, non-return. That means being an anagami. Let alone seven years, if anyone should develop these four foundations of mindfulness in such a way, for six years, five years, four, three, two, one, One of two fruits can be expected for him, either final knowledge here and now, or if there's a trace of craving and clinging left, non-return. Let alone one year. If anyone should develop these four foundations of mindfulness in such a way for seven months, 
six months, five, four, three, two, one, half a month. One of two fruits can be expected for him, either final knowledge here and now, or if there's a trace of craving and clinging left, non-return. Let alone half a month, monks. If anyone should develop these four foundations of mindfulness in such a way for seven days. How long have you been here? One of two fruits can be expected for him, either final knowledge here and now, or if there's a trace of craving and clinging left, non-return. So it was with reference to this that it was said, monks, this is a direct path for the purification of beings, for surmounting sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and grief, for the attainment of a, a true way, for the realization of Nibbana, namely the four foundations of mindfulness. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So now you've heard all of the four foundations, but you've heard it in a different way than you might have heard from other teachers. But you see that what I'm showing you is straight from the book. And it does have to do with your being able to experience jhanas and have a pure mind. And the way you get that is by practicing the six R's with whatever arises. But here's a merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation. Thus.